Hello, I'm Munisa Shamsi, and it gives me great pleasure to have Amitav Ghosh with us today. He hardly needs any introduction. He is the author of some 15 books and um, one of the most distinguished fiction writers and nonfiction writers uh, today. He was born in Calcutta and grew up in India, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, and uh, studied at Delhi, Oxford, Alexandria, and received a doctor, doctorate in anthropology from Oxford University. His work has been translated into some 30 languages. His celebrated books include The Circle of Reason, The Shadow Lines, In an Antique Land, Dancing in Cambodia, The Calcutta uh, Chromosome, The Glass Palace, The Hungry Tide, The Ibis Trilogy, consisting of his uh, famous Sea of Poppies, River of Smoke, and Flood of Fire. His most recent nonfiction work is an essay collection the Great Derangement, Climate Change, and the Unthinkable. This appeared in 2016, and he followed this up with a novel called Gun Island in 2019, which also deals with ecology, as indeed does some of his earlier work. His new work, which has just come out, The Jungle Nama, his first book of poetry actually, is a narrative poem, illustrated by the Pakistani American Salman Tour and it has just come out this month. It is a stunning reconstruction of a timeless Bengali fable of Bon Bibi, which he refers to in both of his novels in Hungry Tide and Gun Island set in the Sundarbans. He is the recipient of France's Prix Medici Etranger Prize, the Sahitya Academy Award, the Arthur C. Clarke Award, the International Ebook Award, the Frankfurt Book Fair Award, the Crossword Book Award, um, the India Prize, Golden Quill Award, and recently for uh, the Great Derangement, the Utah Award for Environmental Studies. In India, he is the only writer in English to have won the prestigious Janpath Award. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> it's Gyanpeet. Um, huh? It's Gyanpeet. Jan Pete, so sorry. Um, <laughs> That's fine. Well, and his essays appeared in leading publications and have been widely anthologized. He has also two new uh, nonfiction works due to be published this year. And so it is with great pleasure that I welcome Amitav Ghosh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's so nice to be uh, uh, with, with your festival today. So nice to be speaking to you. It's great to have you here. Thank you. So, um, should we begin with the Jungle Nama, I think? Yes, can, can absolutely. You, um, I mean, it's a wonderful tale and it blends in Persian and Arabic and Sanskrit sources. And, um, well, I think I'll leave you to tell us a little about it. How did it evolve? Um, what is the symbolism of it? Um, and so on. Well, let me show you the book first, because you probably won't be <laughs> seeing it um, uh, for a while. Uh, it comes out actually next week, but it'll, oh, okay. uh, it'll be in the, in the shops next week. So Jungle Nama is an adaptation of a folk tale from the Shundurbon. Uh, the Shundurbon is the world's largest mangrove forest. It's in uh, southern Bengal. It extends over uh, West Bengal in India and uh, into Bangladesh. Uh, you know, it's a it's an ab absolutely astonishing landscape, and uh, you know, it's something I've been writing about uh, for years. In the, my book, The Hungry Tide is set there, and in uh, in my book, The Hungry Tide, uh, I I wrote at some length about um, uh, this uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, this story, the story of Bon Bibi. So Bon Bibi is like uh, you know, she's like uh, the sort of being of the forest. You know, she's like the spirit queen of the forest. So some, uh, some people uh, regard her as a goddess. The Hindus think of her as a goddess, if you like, but for the Muslims, she is like a female peer, but she is completely sort of, uh, uh, you know, trans-religious as it were. So the people who live in the Shundarbun, uh, for her, she's a very, very important part of their, uh, part of their lives. I mean, you know, she really, 
uh, is their source of protection. Because, you know, the people who live there are extremely, uh, you know, they're extremely vulnerable in so many ways. Uh, they go into the forest uh, to collect uh, to collect honey, basically, or timber, or, uh, you know. And, you know, they lead very, very difficult lives. They're often attacked by tigers or by crocodiles and, of course, snakes. So she is their, <clears throat> she is their protective spirit, if you like. So the idea behind the story is actually a really, it's a beautiful idea as far as I'm concerned. It's an idea of how people, how to find a balance between the, need, between the needs of humans and the needs of non-humans, you know, the needs of the forest. So Bon Vivi is uh, sort of the spirit who, who creates, as it were, a balance between the two. So it's a very important kind of ecological fable, if you like, and uh, you know, if you think of English, I mean, it's been said that, you know, this idea of balance, this idea of finding a sort of uh, an equity between humans and non-humans is very important in indigenous cultures everywhere. Uh, it's very important here in North America amongst North American uh, indigenous peoples, for example. Uh, but such stories are very rare and indeed almost non-existent uh, in English, you know. Uh, in English, you know, stories are really all about getting more, about, you know, uh, there being no limits, there being always, uh, you know, you could, uh, being ambitious and so on. So I, I do feel that it's important to have different kinds of stories about the world and about how uh, we relate to the world around us. So I've, I've long felt that it was important to, uh, you know, uh, for me to tell this story in a in a fuller way. But uh, this story is actually <clears throat> quite different from anything I've done before. Because I decided to, uh, my adaptation is in verse. I wouldn't yes. call it poetry, but it's, uh, but it's verse, you know, it's a, uh, and it's in the verse meter in which the original Bengali is, uh, a story is told. Uh, this meter is called Poyar. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting meter, it's couplets, uh, of 12 syllable lines. So I've adapted it in this form. And I must say it was a very exciting thing to do. And also, you know, right from the start, when I started working on this, uh, on Jungle Nama, I wanted it to be a collaborative effect, effort. You know, I wanted it to be a collaborative project. I wanted to work with an artist, you know, and uh, the first artist who came to mind was Salman, who I've known since he was a student. Oh, nice. you know? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, how lovely. Yes, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Salman was a student right here in Brooklyn. He was at Pratt, mm -hmm. at the Pratt Institute down the road. And that's mm -hmm. when I first saw his work. Uh, you know, he, uh, he did a student show and that's when I saw his work for the mm -hmm. first time. And it was evident to me right then that, uh, you know, Salman is, a, is an artist of extraordinary talent. You know, I mean, uh, it, his, grif his gifts are really, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, are quite incredible. I mean, they're not with, he's not within an ordinary range of talent, you know, his, in, in his yeah, talent there's something yes. mm. quite excessive almost, I would say. So I wanted to work with Salman, but in fact, in the beginning, I was, uh, I, I, I was, I was nervous of asking him because, uh, you know, he had a big show opening in New York this year. I mean, since his student days, Salman's become incredibly successful. Uh, so he had a big show opening at the Whitney, uh, at the Whitney Museum here which is a very rare thing. It's a very rare honor for, you know, an artist of his age. Yes, yes. Uh, so he was very busy with that and I was hesitant to sort of uh, impose on him. But uh, then uh, the pandemic intervened, you know, so his show got, uh, got postponed by a few months, which opened up a window. And, uh, you know, he was able to do this work. And uh, I, I must say that was one of the most wonderful parts of writing this book, you know, just this collaboration, uh, just seeing how he was able to bring the ideas onto the page. Uh, it was actually really, I must say, mesmerizing. I mean, uh, just the work that he did and how he did it, it's, um, uh, it was astonishing. I don't speak of his work as illustrations because the whole idea was to recreate, if you like, or to create a modern version uh, of the illuminated manuscript, you know, of a, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar That's with the wonderful, big, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, there's such a rich yes. tradition of the illuminated manuscript, uh, you know, especially in the Indian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and in Persia, for example. So that's that was the kind of uh, that was the kind of thing I had in mind, you know, uh, where a, a, a book in which uh, the text doesn't necessarily have primacy, you know, where where the text and the image are uh, are matched with each other, uh, where the images actually illuminate, uh, you know, the text. Uh, so I think of uh, Salman's work for this uh, uh, for this project as uh, illuminations, and I think they really are. I mean, uh, the, the images are so powerful that they create, as it were, uh, you know, uh, uh, another narrative, you know, which is uh, sort of uh, conjoined with uh, with the textual narrative. So, you know, I really feel that it's very important for us to get away from the logocentricism, you know, uh, of, uh, of the contemporary, contemporary print world. So, you know, in so many ways, it was a very exciting project to do. Well, it's, what, what, I mean, his uh, illustrations of what I've seen, you know, from the advanced copy, they're very beautiful. I was also struck actually by the imagery of the poetry itself. I thought there was a beautiful imagery Oh, you know, and, and also the, um, you know, the, the, the fight between the gods and uh, how the land was divided, um, you know, and one was given to uh, Dukhenrai. Dukhenrai, yes. is that right? Yes, absolutely. And, you yes. know, and the other was kept a born baby and so on. And, and the whole imagery of the beehive. And then you get, I was, again, very interested in the human intervention. Um, and, and then you get Dona. Yes. who's come this trader who's this ambitious trader and then he exploits his cousin Duque. can you comment well there are two things i want to comment on these characters the human intervention and perhaps you can also tell us what uh, i mean when you transpose the poem into english verse what are the challenges or are there, are there none Oh no! I mean, they, they, it's very, very challenging. It's very difficult. I would uh, think so. You know, I, I should say here that my interest in uh, doing something in Poyar essentially was inspired by my old friend um, Adha Shahid Ali. You know, uh, oh, really? Shahid. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, Shahid was a very dear friend. Uh, in fact, Shahid mm -hmm. lived right here in Brooklyn, just down the street from me, and oh, you know, we used okay. to spend a lot of time yeah. together. So, Shahid, as you probably know. Uh, had a deep interest in uh, in metrical forms, you know. He uh, uh, in the yes. canzone, for example, um, uh, in the villanelle. I mean, he loved writing in very strict, difficult forms. And yes. in fact, uh, Shahid was responsible for introducing the ghazal uh, into uh, into English. You know, he yes. he edited yes. a, a wonderful collection of ghazals. So, you know, Shahid and Shahid loved working with Nita. He thought that instead of um, uh, instead of being a constraint, meter is actually liberating, you know? So I've always, ha I've long had an interest in working with this meter, Poyar, and the Poyar meter is very, is, is a very flexible and beautiful sort of narrative instrument, you know? Uh, <clears throat> you have these uh, 12 syllable lines, but the lines also have a caesura, that is there's a break in the middle, you know? So, uh, you know, it's a meter that's meant to be chanted. It's meant to be performed. It's meant to be mm. read aloud. You know, so it's it's meant to be read collectively, if you like. So that was another aspect of it. But, uh, uh, you know, working with the meter was really fascinating because, uh, you know, it makes you realize uh, that there's a part of your brain that never gets used, you know, simply because we no longer use rhyme so much, you know, because our in the contemporary world, uh, uh, there's a kind of phobia about rhyme, even in poetry, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you start using meter and rhyme, you call upon some part of your brain, uh, which is actually dormant, you know? I mean, you can actually feel it. You can feel a part of your brain, you know, becoming active in a way <laughs> you never feel otherwise. So I think it's a wonderful thing to work with rhyme. And I think we should teach our children, uh, you know, to, um, to work with rhyme because really, why should we let this part of our brains lie unused? So it was it was a wonderful thing to do, and I'm actually uh, now working quite closely with my Italian translators, who are translating uh, this into um, Italian using uh, the same Poyar meter. That and, difficult. Uh, sorry, I said that must be quite difficult translating into the language, you know. From uh, yes, uh, yeah, I think it was initially, but now that they're into it, you know, it's 
they're just doing it so fluently. It reads like it was written in Italian. You know, it also helps that Italian also has a, a metrical form of 12 syllables and so on. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it's just an incredibly flexible and beautiful meter, you know, and um, it, it was just uh, delightful to work with it. And it's a very old metrical form. You know, in Bangla, it goes back um, at least 800 years. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's been used for what's called uh, what's kavya. You know, it's um, uh, these are narrative poems. Uh, in uh, uh, some of these narrative poems are about gods and goddesses. Uh, equally, the, uh, this form is used by has been used by many Muslim writers uh, to write about saints and to you know there's a there's a peer called Ghazi peer. Uh, there's another peer called Satya peer. So there are long narrative poems about these figures. And they're all in this Poyar meter. Uh, you know, uh, the, the culture of Bengal is very, very interpenetrated. You know, it's very hard to say which element comes from where. And in that sense, I think it's a bit like uh, uh, Sindh, you know, historically, which also had, uh, you know, yes, these very is. sort of syncretic elements. Yes. Um, I, well, can we go back also to the to the story to the to the human intervention in this uh, into this beautiful terrain, because that also has a relationship to some of your other books in a sense. Yes, yes. Um, so you know, uh, you you mentioned the characters and so on. So what is fundamentally uh, uh, the theme of the story is that there's enough in this world, to use uh, Mahatma Gandhi's words there's enough in this world to meet everyone's needs, but not, not to cater to anyone's greed, you know? So yes. the, the whole idea is that Dhana, one of the characters, is driven by greed and he goes into the forest to sort of despoil the forest and, you know, um, to extract the riches of the forest. Uh, and that's when Dukkhinrai, uh, uh, that, that's when Dukkhinrai sort of creates a, a kind of conspiracy with him to hand Dukhe over because Dukkhinrai, you know, he's the tiger and he hasn't eaten human flesh for a long time. So he wants to eat this boy. Uh, but finally, Bondidi steps in and, and saves Dukhe. But, you know, there are very sort of interesting, I mean, just narrative elements. You know, there's, a, there's a, an interesting relationship between Dukhe and his mother. There's the mm -hmm. whole sort of, if you like, the subplot of migration, you know of leaving the yeah. land of you know young men having to migrate mm. and you know this is a, this is a this is absolutely a reality in today's bengal uh, as it is actually in today's pakistan i mean so many young uh, young uh, uh, young men are actually uh, leaving and migrating over these enormously long distances into europe uh, you know mm. uh, so it's you know there are so many elements of this story that actually connect to modern times so, uh, you know, another aspect of the story is the relationship between Dhana and Dukhe. Dhana is the rich relative, uh, Dukhe is the poor relative. And as you know, as you know this, uh, these, these are absolutely sort of uh, fundamental aspects of narrative in South Asia, you know, the rich relative trying to exploit uh, the poor relative, yes. <laughs> you know. So there are so many interesting elements to the, uh, to the relations between the characters. No, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful tale. I wondered, um, do you have a personal relationship with the Sundarbans? I mean, you must do their feature in at least two of your books. And uh, how did you sort of get involved with the uh, ecology and the, this whole sort of um, sense of, uh, well, you know, everything that it is, it so, comes through so clearly in your books? Well, uh, I, yes, I do have a very old relationship with the Sundarbund, but I'll need to tell you a little bit of the history of the Sundarbund for, uh, for that. Uh, in the early 20th century, there was a man called Sir Daniel Hamilton, uh, mm -hmm. a Scotsman who made a huge fortune. Uh, uh, you know, he had the agency for the P&O line. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you remember the P&O line, I'm sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, a lot of young people, I'm sure, have never heard of the P&O line, so I thought I'd... Oh, I well, we're, we're sort of, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So he, he had this huge fortune and he decided that he wanted to colonize the Shundarbun, you know? Oh. So he bought up a large part of this territory. He moved in a lot of, uh, he created a, a large estate. And it's an it was an interesting estate in many ways because uh, he introduced electricity, uh, you know, into the Shundarbun long before it was even introduced mm -hmm. into cities. 
uh, in India. So he created this kind of, uh, you know, he called it an estate and so on, uh, brought in, uh, you know, tens of thousands of uh, farmers from elsewhere. He had this idea that he would create, uh, you know, rice farms and so on uh, in this region. You know, it's that sort of uh, uh, British idea of uh, settler colonialism, if you like. I mean, that's really what he was trying to create in the Shundurbud. Mm. And in many ways, it was a complete disaster. But the fact that human beings are there today has a lot to do with Sir Daniel Hamilton. Now, Sir Daniel Hamilton had these estate managers who looked after his, his estate. And one of my uncles was uh, his estate manager, you know. Oh, really? How interesting. <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, when I was a child, my uncle was living there in the Shundurbon and my cousins were there. My cousins grew up there. My uncle was also a school teacher plus an estate manager. So we used to go and visit him, uh, you know, and it, it was kind of so interesting because, you know, I, I grew up in the, in the city, but when we went to the Shundurbon, you know, you'd wake up in the morning and see that a snake had dropped on your mosquito net, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so there was always, uh, it was always very uh, kind of interesting. So I had this very long connection with the Shundurbon and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, Randabagh, it was actually the year 2000 uh, when I started uh, working on the Hungry Tide. And then I spent, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of time there traveling around the Shundurbur, just, uh, you know, being there. And, uh, you know, it became very much a part of my imaginative landscape, I must say. Uh, it's a very powerful kind of, uh, it's a very, very powerful uh, terrain, you know, it's like nothing else. Uh, you know, when you think of a forest, I'm sure you and uh, your idea of a forest is basically of a deciduous forest, you know, something that you might see in the mountains, uh, you know, tall trees, uh, you know, beautiful undergrowth and that kind of thing. But uh, a mangrove forest is completely different. Uh, sadly, I believe all the mangroves at the mouth of the Indus are gone now. And I, I, I've heard even that the Indus uh, doesn't even well, there's a big crisis in Karachi over the mangroves that they've been yeah. doing they're, they're building things that they're doing away with our mangroves so that the, so a lot of things about the sea that you mentioned in some of your books and things uh, actually make me think of Karachi the mangrove well I actually to go back slightly I do uh, in the days of East Pakistan Sundarbans was something I grew up with this oh really uh, yeah. I grew up with this word and because my father had worked in a company in a multinational he traveled right across Bengal as a young man Ah. He used to go by boat, he used to go, he was going to sleep on the railway stations, you know, all this. He was with the Imperial Tobacco. Oh, really? Uh, yes. Yeah, ITC. Yeah. Yes. yes, he went off to Calcutta and joined the ITC. Oh, my goodness. Long to that now. So I, Sundarbans is something very much apart, but the mangrove issue is a big issue in Karachi. And the other thing you talk about is how the livelihood, um, somewhere I read one of your statements where you said the, uh, today's fishermen don't really know what their grandfathers talked caught, I mean. And uh, that is also something true in Karachi, where a lot of the fishermen have had to become, you know, townspeople and this kind of thing. So there is that kind of echo, or there's a different uh, landscape. Well, you know, across South Asia, uh, we are facing an ecological catastrophe, you know, an I absolute know. catastrophe on a scale that is truly unimaginable. I'm sure you've seen these recent IPCC reports about uh, the Arabian Sea and uh, the Bay of Bengal. There are these enormous dead zones that have appeared, you know, where there's mm. no oxygen in the water. So the, <clears throat> so fish can't survive. So, you know, you'll have seen yeah. all these uh, really disturbing stories about, you know, the, the fishermen from South India ending up in, uh, uh, in Pakistani territorial waters and ending up in prison and so on. Uh, it's because, uh, there's no fish left, you know, all the fish, the fish stocks have dwindled catastrophically. And, you know, I, I sometimes wonder why our media in South Asia doesn't address these questions at all, because, you know, we are talking about two bodies of water, the Arabian Sea and uh, the Bay of Bengal, which together support, you know, hundreds of millions of people, probably as much as, you know, half a billion people depend directly upon these stretches of water for their livelihood. And their livelihoods are actually disappearing as we speak. I mean, we are seeing, in fact, the unfolding of a catastrophe on a scale that uh, really is unimaginable. 
and still, you know, there's so little public discussion of it. There's so little public discussion of the uh, of, um, of these dead zones, for example. Because when I was, uh, you know, uh, when I started researching my book, The Hungry Tide, uh, way back in uh, 2000, uh, 21 years ago now, already then you could see the effects of climate change in the Shundarbon, you know, I mean, there was massive saltwater intrusion, uh, islands were drowning, you could see the effects of sea level rise, saltwater intrusion, all these things, habitat loss. So that was when I became really sort of concerned about what was happening there. And then in the following years, you know, there were these devastating cyclones that, uh, you know, there was a, there was a cyclone Aila in 2009, which really hit the Shundurbun very hard uh, and destroyed the, you know, not many people died because uh, nowadays uh, there are very good preparation measures, evacuation measures, which the government has got very good at, uh, the uh, uh, regional governments. But still, a lot of people lost their livelihoods. And this year, in the midst of this pandemic, you know, there was a, there was another cyclone, Cyclone Amphan, which again devastated uh, de devastated the region. So it was through the Shundurban that I really came to be sort of uh, interested in climate change. And then once you get into the literature on climate change, it's actually absolutely harrowing. I mean, you really, uh, I mean, it just completely shakes you up. Uh, once you realize what is ahead for the world, it's impossible to take your eyes off it, honestly. And that was, uh, that was when I began to wonder, why is it that uh, in contemporary literature, uh, we, don't, uh, uh, we don't talk about these issues at all? You know, it's a strange thing, because actually, if you think about it, we as writers, as literary people, we address so many issues. We address politics of various kinds. Uh, we address, uh, you know, gender politics. We address all sorts of things. Why is it that these issues, these wider issues about the world that we live in, are so difficult for us to cope with? Why do they elude us so much? So, you know, I began to think about those issues. And I, that's how I wrote my book, The Great Derangement. But, you know, I'm happy to say that the book has had an enormous impact, I think, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly surprised by the sort of impact it has. And <clears throat> certainly since the book came out in the last five years, there's been an outpouring of new writing uh, on, on these issues. And uh, a little part of it is perhaps due to, my, uh, due to the book. Uh, because it I was guess, a huge bestseller, wasn't it? This, this is the hungry tide, or you're talking about your yes. I'm talking about the essays, the great derangement. The essays, yes. That that that's also had tremendous coverage. Uh, it has. The hungry tide was a huge bestseller, also. Uh, the hungry tide did very well. Yes, actually, it uh, it did. But uh, the the great derangement has really had an impact, you know, on writers because uh, mm -hmm. I get that sense because I constantly get people now sending me manuscripts or sending me, you know, uh, uh, plays that they've written, songs that they've written, artwork that they've done. I mean, to the point where I, I feel gratified to see this response. And at the same time, I feel rather overwhelmed sometimes, you know? I mean, how many manuscripts can you read after all? That's true. I want, there was another thing I, I was interested in. Um, is your response, to, well, in a sort of a response to the you wrote this book, The Calcutta Chromosome, which, which is not quite like about this parasite, but you talked about a parasite that mutated and there was this group of people who were trying to develop a particular chromosome about it. And do you see a relationship with that, with what happened today, uh, the pandemic and how it's happened and how it's going to affect us? Can you talk a little about that? I mean, I, I know the two things are quite different, but I was fascinated that you had thought of this idea of, mutation and parasites and all that and future references well many years you know, ago. Uh, the the calcutta chromosome is a kind of uh, uh, is, is a kind of uh, what what shall we say a medical mystery if you like it's yes, uh, uh, it's of sort of science fiction and actually yes. a lot of it is about uh, uh, the internet so you know <laughs> yes <laughs> yes absolutely i wrote it uh, in 1993 it was a long time ago Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, it's about malaria because, uh, you know, Calcutta as a city played a very important part in the solution of what might be called the malaria puzzle. Uh, Ronald mm -hmm. Ross, a doctor in the Indian Medical Service, uh, uh, was working in Calcutta. And he, it was in Calcutta that he did this work where he discovered uh, the life cycle of the malaria, of, of the malaria parasite. 
But what's actually very interesting about it is that when I started reading uh, uh, Ronald Ross's uh, uh, notes, and he published diaries and so on, but when I started reading those diaries and notes, it was so clear that at every step of his work, he was helped by Indians, you know, by various kinds of, by servants sometimes. And actually a lot of it was by servants. A lot of the critical connections in his work came to him from his assistants and his servants. Uh, it was a servant of his who showed him the difference between uh, two different kinds of mosquitoes, you know, Anopheles and Culex. Uh, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the other connections also came to him. I mean, in fact, the connection with mosquitoes was suggested to him uh, by one of his servants. So yeah. I found this very interesting, and uh, you know, so it became a sort of science fiction in reverse, in that it's a historical science fiction. But the wonderful mm -hmm. part of it was, you know. Uh, it won the Arthur C. Clarke Award. Yes, I know, yes. Yes, and that was in the year 2001. Mm. And, you know, it was such a strange experience. I'd been invited to go to Sri Lanka that year. And uh, as it happened, I arrived uh, at the airport uh, two or three days after the whole airport had been blown up by the Tamil Tiger. Oh. Yeah, it was a it was an extraordinary experience. I mean, if you think about it, you know that that happened uh, before nine eleven, really. So it was, uh, it was almost a kind of bookending of our of our modern times, if you like. It's so happened. there I was, uh, and I, you know, I felt it very necessary to go simply because I could tell that uh, all my friends there were really traumatized by uh, what had happened, and I was going to do uh, deliver this lecture, which is named uh, after a very eminent uh, human rights activist in uh, Sri Lanka. So, so I went there and. Uh, after my lecture, I was I was leaving when who should pull up but uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Oh, Sir really? Arthur C. Clarke, yes. <laughs> and he oh, said, wow. come over to my house. So I went to his house and I must say it was such an extraordinary experience uh, because his house, which is uh, which was in Colombo, <clears throat> you know, it was just plastered with, uh, with these photographs of incredibly famous people, you know, <laughs> actors, um, admirals, and just sitting in his in his office. He was in a wheelchair. I was constantly getting phone calls from the admiral of the US fleet, oh, from yes. prime ministers. I mean, it was kind of, it was almost surreal. And then after a while, he said to me, come, let's go and play table tennis, <laughs> you know? So he took me off to his club, which was actually a club that I knew from my own uh, 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 stays in Sri Lanka. So he went off to this club and he insisted on playing table tennis, but he was a very clever, uh, he was a very clever man, you know, uh, he made up his own rules. So he would play only on half the table and you had to play on the, on the full table. You know? Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, it was a very interesting encounter. Quite an experience. And the other thing, of course, you've been very, uh, a lot of your work deals with history and about colonialism and I suppose that really brings us to your Ibis uh, trilogy, yes. the, the Sea of Poppies and so on. Can you talk, us, uh, talk to us about that, about the impact of colonialism and it, 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 it kind of links, India becomes a sort of center of the subcontinent, there's, you, you, you engage with Mauritius, you engage with China, then there's the British, there, there are all kinds of different communities, this whole sort of one world kind of idea. Can you, can you talk to us about that? It's not one word because it's colonized, but you know, this interaction of different people. Well, you know, that takes me back actually a little beyond the, the Ibis trilogy to my novel, The Glass Palace, you know, mm -hmm. which, is yes. in, uh, which is largely set in what is uh, today Myanmar. Yes. And <clears throat> while writing The Glass Palace, I became very interested in this, uh, in this whole phenomenon uh, of the indenture, you know, of indentured workers going from India and, you know, millions of uh, Indians left in the 19th century, uh, you know, South Asians, millions and millions uh, went off to, uh, you know, many island nations in the Caribbean, uh, in, <clears throat> in Fiji, uh, Mauritius, but also many millions were uh, migrated to uh, Burma and uh, to Malaysia, you know, and later those uh, those communities became very active in the in the Indian National Army during the Second World War. So this story uh, became very compelling for me because you know I've always been interested in uh, in stories of dispersal, if you if you like, or displacement. 
simply because you know my own family was originally from Bangladesh, but in the 19th century, uh, they were displaced by a flood and moved into what is now Bihar. Uh, you know, so because of this history, I was very interested in uh, in indenture, in displacement, in migration. But when I started looking into the whole question of migration uh, out of India, you know, there's a very curious kind of fact in that, which is that the great majority of the migrants actually come from a single district, you know, uh, they came from this area, uh, uh, Bhojpur, where people speak the language Bhojpuri, which is actually exactly the area that my ancestors had settled in, uh, really? in the 19th century. You know, uh, in this region around uh, Patna, between basically between Patna and Banaras, you know. Mm -hmm. So I started asking myself the question, you know, why are so many millions of uh, people leaving this area? You know, which is, it's, you know, you, usually when you have mass migration from a region, these regions tend to be coastal regions, you know, uh, like say, for, for example, Sindh or Bengal. But uh, this region, Bhojpur, is way inland. You know, and it has no connections with the seas. In fact, the people there had the, had all these uh, mythologies about the sea as Kalapani, you know, the black water and so on. Yes. So I kept wondering why are they leaving? Why were people leaving in such large numbers? And that's when I came upon this whole phenomenon that I that really we are, we are never taught about, uh, which is that the British in the in the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries, uh, you know. Uh, the East India Company's largest trade commodity was actually tea, and that tea came from China, you know. Yes. And at a certain point, they were losing uh, enormous quantities of silver, and they, you know, they had this balance of payments problem with China, just like they have today. And back then, they decided that, that the only solution to this balance of payments problem uh, was to find some other commodity to trade. And what commodity did they decide on? It was opium. You know, so they decided to start cultivating opium on a very large scale in uh, in this region, in this Bhojpur region. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was an agricultural in, uh, intervention that uh, basically, you know, created a sort of agricultural crisis of some kind. Uh, so that, you know, there were famines, there was uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, this whole region was in fact uh, pretty much devastated by uh, by the opium trade. So, you know, all those things came together <clears throat> and I became more and more interested in this whole question of, uh, you know, the role of opium uh, in the life of the Indian subcontinent. You know, the reason why the British uh, attacked Sindh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, in the early 19th century was basically because they wanted to control uh, opium exports that were going out of Karachi, you know. <laughs> Opium was fundamental to the entire life, uh, to the entire commercial life of the Indian subcontinent. You know, there's a book being written uh, with the title Bombay Opium City. Uh, really? Bombay, yes, Bombay was the biggest uh, opium exporter. Bombay was actually built upon opium. Uh, so many of the commercial fortunes that you see uh, in that region, uh, you know, uh, came out of opium, you know. At every level, I mean, every India, Indian commercial community was involved with, uh, with uh, you know, the opium trade in one way or the other. You know, if you look at these, uh, these huge palaces that exist across India in, uh, in the princely states, what financed them? It was opium. You know, it was, uh, it was opium growing in, uh, in the region of Gwalior, in the region of Jaipur, in, the re in this whole Malwa region. Uh, basically, that's what. Uh, 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 that's what There's very little known about this. I mean, we know the opium trade was big, but we don't know these kind of details. It's very fascinating. It was completely the the entire knowledge of this has been completely suppressed. Yes, you know, that's the extraordinary thing. It's been completely suppressed. Uh, it's a it's such a weird a weird thing. So the you know the more I read about it, the deeper I got into it, I became you know kind of really almost obsessed with it really. So the the last part of the book, the flood of fire, is uh, uh, is really about the first opium war, and uh, you know the first opium war was largely fought by soldiers from the Indian subcontinent. You know, yes. it was financed mm -hmm. by uh, uh, merchants from the Indian subcontinent. You know, yeah. uh, so it's such an extraordinary story that, uh, but it's completely suppressed. You will never find it in the histories that uh, we are taught about colonialism. We've create, created, if you like, this mythology about a, a, somehow a sort of uh, 
a subcontinental past, which is uh, kind of pure and so on. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, opium has a very long history uh, in the Indian supply. It was never cultivated on a mass scale. But, uh, you know, Babur, the emperor, in the Babur Nama, he writes about his consumption of majun, uh, you know, which was... Oh, a, really? Yeah, at great length, he writes about it. Mm. Uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, basically a kind of uh, narcotic, uh, including uh, opium, mm. you know. So, you know, it's a very long story and it's a, it's a very interesting story. And, it, uh, you know, it's also a terribly sad story, you know, because it's left a terrible legacy, um, really, um, across uh, the Indian subcontinent, I would say. Uh, well, can I go back to your earlier book, to, to Shadow Lines? What, what, what lay behind that? That's a story of migration of a divided family. I thought it was beautifully done. The Thank divided you. family, and the other thing I loved about it was the way that the Desis chat. So there's this British family who don't know details about themselves, who are their friends. And because they're, the, the children grew up chatting that there was this person and that person, they go back and they, they, they're able to fill in little details because the English don't chat in this way. Other than the division of the family, you've got Dhaka and you've got Calcutta. Can you tell us a little about that? Uh, you know, uh, the shadow lines uh, really grew out uh, of my experiences uh, in Delhi, uh, living in Delhi in 1984. You know, there was mm -hmm. a lot of communal violence in Delhi at that time. And it made me think about, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, there were these uh, sort of uh, uh, terrible attacks on uh, Sikhs after the death of, uh, after the assassination of Indira Gandhi. And so it was a, it was a, it was a city that was riven with, uh, you know, with tensions and so on. And living, living there at that time made me reflect on, uh, you know, my own sort of memories of uh, communal tensions and communal violence and so on. And uh, you know, made me think about my own family and the and the you know the legacies of um, of partition, uh, because you know, in in so many ways, my family is a partition family. We are from uh, we are from Bangladesh, and uh, you know, <clears throat> even though my, uh, my father's family left uh, in the nineteenth century, my mother's family especially had very close connections uh with what is now bangladesh uh, with the uh, with the ancestral district in fact they spoke uh the dialect of uh, what is now uh, of madaripur district in, uh, in really? what is now bangladesh yes so they were, you know all of that it made me really have to uh, contend with this uh, you know the fractured nature of the consciousness of those of us who come from those regions uh, which have been divided mm -hmm. in this way you know because those divisions, you know, they exist as political realities, but in many ways they don't exist as psychic realities. You know, the, the, the psychic sense of uh, of who we are is uh, is much more complicated, uh, you know, than any sort of political reality that uh, we, mm. uh, that we, that we contend with in everyday life. And just to give you an example of that, you know, uh, my latest book, uh, Gun Island, uh, is uh, you know. It again started with my uh, encounters uh, with the Bangladeshi migrants uh, in Venice, you know. Really? Yes, Venice is a city I've known for a very, very long time, you know. I've been visiting there for, uh, for, a, for a long time. But in, uh, I, was, uh, I was invited a few years ago to spend some time there by the university in Venice. It's called Kafoskari. Uh, it's actually a, a great university, especially for languages. Uh, it has a wonderful department of uh, Bengali and of uh, Urdu, Persian, etc. So I was spending time there and uh, I suddenly noticed one day that the entire working class of Venice is Bengali, Bengali speaking. Oh, really? uh -huh. You know, everywhere you look, ev the people who make the pizzas, the people who play the accordion, uh, the people who sell fish in the market, the people who, who are running the shops, the people who work in the hotels, they're all uh, Bengali. And not only are they Bengali, they're Bengali, uh, they speak, actually, a lot of them speak the dialect that my grandmother spoke, you know, amazing. which is the dialect. Yeah. Yes, it was completely amazing, you know. I mean, and, uh, you know, I became very fascinated with this phenomenon of, uh, you know, this sort of mass displacement, uh, if you like. It, 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 in a way, it's the same story that led me into, uh, say, the Ibis trilogy. 
But in, 20, in, 20, uh, in 2015, 20, uh, 2017, I spent a lot of time in Italy, actually traveling around, uh, um, around Italy to migrant camps, you know, where the, where the, uh, where the refugees who cross the Mediterranean are. And you know, a very large number of these refugees are actually South Asian. Very large number are from Bangladesh and a very large number are from Pakistan, you know? So uh, actually there's a, there's a refugee camp in uh, Sicily called Kaltanisetta, in a tiny town called Kaltanisetta. This really? camp is majority Pakistani. So, uh, you know, I became very interested in this phenomenon and I started interviewing, uh, interviewing these refugees. And, you know, it's a very interesting thing when you speak to these refugees in their own languages. You know, so speaking to them in Urdu or speaking to them in Bangla, yes. you get a completely different picture yes. of their travels. For example, a lot of the Pakistani refugees I met uh, told me that they were from uh, the Punjab region and the reason they had left was because of the Jhelum floods of 2012. Oh, really? Yes, and you know, I had never heard of the Jhelum floods. And I even asked my Pakistani friends, what are the Jhelum floods? They had never heard of it. But you see, that's what happened. I mean, there was a, there was a flood, as you know, I mean, the, the, the entire Indus basin is flooding more and more, become more and more erratic, you know. So, uh, you know, they found their land swamped and, uh, you know, they decided not to go back. They just left. They, <laughs> And instead of moving to the cities, many of them just decided, okay, we'll take our chances and go abroad. So you see, this is the way that our, our world is changing. And, uh, you know, we have to attend to this because the environment, uh, climate change, the realities of the changing of it are very much behind these phenomena. You know, uh, you know it's been a very difficult time in so many ways, uh, you know. Uh, for me, the, uh, the pandemic has been in many ways a complete nightmare. You know, uh, mm. my mother died in Kolkata in August and I wasn't able I'm to I'm so go. sorry. Yes, it, mm, was, yeah. uh, it, was, it was really terrible. Mm. Well, well, it's wonderful. You look forward to your new books. And I'm sorry that it's been such a difficult time. And despite that, you've been able to be so creative and so productive. And it's been a great pleasure talking to you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a great, great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.